but I want to take the phone call of a good friend of the program and a good friend in general. He's a three-time NBA champion. Won the, the He was part of the first three-peat of the Chicago Bulls, and every single Monday we plan on having a guest on from that era to talk about the two episodes of The Last Dance that will be airing the night before. And our first guest is B.J. Armstrong. How are you, B.J.? Which I'm doing very well, and, uh, you know, hope you are doing well, the family. We you are. guys are staying safe, and uh, thanks again for, for having me on the of show. Of course. Susie wanted to send her best. My wife who loves uh, – everybody loves B.J. Armstrong, so um, glad, <laughs> glad you have it on here. Did you learn anything new last night, B.J., watching the first two well, episodes? Well, it's um, – you know, if it's, it's, you know, as I was, I was sharing this with my wife last night, it's always weird. I've always felt uncomfortable watching myself on television, right? Like a, a, a old game would come on, and I'll just walk out of the room. This is really weird to watch because, you know, you, you, you knew the stories, and to watch it and know where, what's coming up next, hmm. it's a, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of weird to watch, right? It's kind of eerie a little bit, and. Uh, but it was fun, right, to revisit because you're seeing the reaction of so many people who didn't know these stories, and especially uh, the youth today. So, um, you know, it's been interesting to watch the reactions. Well, obviously, again, you were not part of the last dance. As a matter of fact, I mean, uh, in, in, by that I mean the final uh, three-peat of the Bulls. But you were, mm-hmm. we did see, we did catch you last night hugging Michael after a Warriors game because you were on the Warriors at the time. We did, uh, we did kind of spot you uh, doing that last night. But I guess I will just start here uh, with this question that a lot of people are going to have throughout the 10 episodes. Why did this team get broken up? Why, BJ? Well, you know, you know, Rich, um, when you play sports, you and you play and you win, you know, one of the things that I think you always have known and what I learned very quickly when I came in this league is Rich, when it ends, it always ends bad. Mm. Always. And I learned that watching the Pistons, when the Pistons run ended, it ended bad. When the Lakers living out here in LA now, when the Lakers run ended with Shaq and Kobe, it just ended bad. And, you know, you can look now at the Patriots, you know, with, with Brady, when it ends, it always ends bad. It's never a right time. It's never a wrong time. But you know it's going to end. So um, I think it was Pat Riley or someone you know, said it best. You know, the ego, the me, is going to end every – it's going to end every run. And it's just a matter of when it's going to happen, not if it's going to happen. And that's just human – that's human – that's human behavior. And it's human behavior at its highest moment. And um, – You know, watching the Bulls, you know, I learned, you know, on the job, you know, that the greatest opponent, the greatest opponent that I faced in sports was success and failure. How are you going to deal with it? And what you're seeing here, you know, in the first two episodes anyway, you see, you know, how challenging it is to not do it just individually, but collectively as a group so that you can continue to get to the end result, right? And the end result in sports is winning and ultimately winning the championship. So, um, you know, that's just the way it is. That's a part of the game. That's why, you know, I found it challenging is how could you get these other 11 people and get us all on the same page where something was going to unite us and find us a way to live outside of ourselves, right? Well, it's, um, it, seemed, it seemed to me, Jay, from what I – Yeah, of course. And it seemed to me last night um, seeing how Jordan chafed at a minutes restriction in his second year, chafed coming off the – floor with seconds to go because he had hit his minutes restriction that that was something that soured him on bulls management and it never changed did you see that when you first arrived in chicago well you know rich uh you know that was one of the eye-opening experiences that i experienced if i can just you know just share that um when i came into the league you know i was i was this happy-go-lucky kid right Um, i was living out my dream um But what I quickly found out, that it was a job. And more importantly, it was a business. And um, I struggled with that when I first came in the NBA because I was like, well, someone forgot to tell me that this was a business, right? (laughs) If I didn't make this shot here, they were going to find someone and get someone who could make that shot. It was, you know, it just is what it is. And I think Michael's 
understanding of the business. I mean, he saw it firsthand, and I think that had a great impression. And every player that plays professional sports, they come up, they're faced with that because we think of sports, you know, we have such fond memories of sports and competition and winning and sportsmanship and all of those things. And you suddenly find out that professional sports is a business and it's a business through and through. You can't deny it. And you got to figure out how to deal with it. And my, my way to deal with this was I made a commitment. I can remember when I was a young player, like in my first or second year, I said, look, I'm here. I got a job to do, but I'm going to, I'm not going to allow anyone or anyone in the organization or anyone in this league steal my joy because I, I wanted to always remember what it felt like and what I dreamed about uh, doing, which was playing in the NBA someday. So, um, that, that was tough to watch because every player goes through that and you saw Michael go through it and look at face to face. And I just think that was his moment to understand of what he was really into, right? He was a basketball player, but he also understood the business to such a degree that I think allowed him to achieve success beyond anyone's wildest imagination. Because at the time, no one wasn't building teams around a six six two guard. And that was a challenge in and of itself. Well, in in terms of the animus towards management, I mean, we're seeing in the last dance as it was playing out that they didn't hide it. I mean, they would just bark at Jerry Krause or make fun of him or in the case of Pippen barking at him or or Jordan just openly mocking him. Um, um, what Was that the case when you got there? Did you learn that Jerry Krause was not to be liked or did you have your own relationship with him? What was that like? Well, you, you know, it's the, the the one thing is, um, you know, sports is very interesting because you, you know, you, you're playing this game and you're playing the game and it's heightened emotions. So, um, you know, I I, I I I I I saw it. I saw the the back and forth. I saw all of those things. But again, um, I had to be incredibly professional and never get caught up into anything that was going to allow me not to do my job. Um, yes, did that happen? I think you saw a little bit of it with last night with Scotty, Michael, and those guys. And that was a part of the culture that we had there. Um, but the, the key thing was is that as a group, as a team, um, we never allowed what was going on off the court to affect what was going on on the court. Um, there wasn't anything that was said about not to like this guy or to like this guy. Everyone understood that at any moment, you know, let's just be let's just be very transparent here. At any moment, anyone could have gotten traded. Um, people could have got moved, what have you. You know, if we don't win that series against the Pistons, maybe the whole team is is revamped. Who knows? But the key is is that you know what that's that that's that's part of it, right? And and I learned on the job that I had to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So playing in chaos, playing with all these things swirling around, Hmm. that was everyday normal occurrence for me. I learned how to deal with it and I learned how to perform whatever was going on and just block it out. So I had the attitude, Rich, whatever. That was like my word. (laughs) Whatever, you know, whatever's going on in the bus, whatever, because you know what? Hey, if Michael passed me the ball, I had to make the shot and uh, there were no excuses. B.J. Armstrong here on the Rich Eisen Show. Um, and obviously, you want to talk about business. All business, Michael, was that. And it may stick out like a sore thumb here in 2020, uh, where I guess um, there's a lot more kumbaya in some parts of the world. Um, what was your first impression of Michael? And when did you learn, boy, you better come buttoned up, prepared, bring your A game all the time, B.J.? Well, uh, he just... You know, I, I, I quickly saw him, you know, really transcend, you know, something that I, I had never seen before. You know, most players, you know, I, I've seen players, you know, tap into a zone, right? You have a good game, you might have a good week, you might have a good month. But this guy had a great day every single day. And not only in the games, but he was great in practice. And now I knew that I had to find a way to – play and perform at his level in spite of myself not having a great game. And he demanded that of you physically, mentally, emotionally, every single time he hit the floor. So there was no, well, I had a bad game. Well, okay, he had a bad game, but he still was going to find a way. So he had a, 
he had a principle that he would always say from time to time, you know, the score is always 0-0. Because he was such a he was such an incredible defensive player that if he wasn't scoring and you didn't score, he was still in the game. So as great as he was on the offensive end, really he was a blue-collar, defensive, grinded-out type of player who just happened to be a great offensive player. And as you know, Rich, you know, you've been around – um, you know, defense is about effort and energy, right? Every night you can be a great defensive player. Every night you can give that type of effort. So he just gave all of us who were around him a different way because he was going to find a way to win the game no matter what. He was going to find a way. He was going to, if he needed to get an offensive rebound, if he needed to get a steal, if he needed to make a defensive stop, he was going to do what was ever necessary to do that because he had the skill set but more importantly, he had the mental toughness to focus in and get the job done. And, you know, people talk about doing things, but he could actually go out and do it, and he did it. So, you know what? Um, we had to find a way to elevate our games, if you will, to maintain and support what he was doing because um, he wasn't going to stop. Do you ever get on you? Did he ever curse you out? Of course, of course. <laughs> you know, <laughs> My, one of my fondest memories of Michael is that Michael was one of the guys, right? <laughs> he loved being one of the guys, and he, you know, when the Air Jordan and the cameras were off, he felt comfortable being one of the guys. So trash talking and being truthful with one another is part of building a relationship if you're going to achieve that level of success. But the thing is – Michael also would give it out, but the thing that was most impressive is he could take it. Huh? He could take it. Who would give it to him? Who would give it to him? Nothing you couldn't say back to him. Well, who did that? I don't know if that's going to come out. So he 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 was he was he was truthful in his conversation, but he was respectful to the community areas. Right? You know, you know, when you covered a team, there wasn't music playing around. There wasn't people disrespecting each other in the community spaces. He was very respectful, but he also wanted to apply the pressure because he was, he, he was a person, he was a very simple person. His only objective was to win. So he didn't have a hidden agenda. He wasn't interested in, well, I got to get 35 points. I got to win this game, and I got to do whatever is necessary to win this game. So as complicated as it may seem, it was very, very simple because – he was going to do what he had to do for one objective, to win. And anything else, you know, that, that, that's, that's, you didn't know who he was. And as long as you had that same goal, then you had no problems with that. Sure, but who, who would give it back to him and over what? You know what, I'm going to tell you, you know, Bill Cartwright <laughs> was a terrific veteran. He was a terrific veteran. And when things would happen – Outside, you know, when things happen, you know, of course, Michael was our best player. Of course, you know, he was, he had a huge voice. But Bill Cartwright was the, he was the, he, he, he had, he, when he did speak, it was well taken and received by everyone in that locker room. Because Bill was, he was a pro's pro, right? Mm-hmm. He was a pro. He was a pro in every, the way he prepared, the way he played what he was able to do for the team and all of those things. And he had a huge voice and he was always there. If things kind of got just off the tracks a little bit, Bill had a way, you know, of getting us back on the track. You know, that's why we always na- nicknamed him the teacher. He was the teacher. He was the one who kept us in line. We were all young. Bill had been around. People forget Bill was a 20 point score when in his New York days. Mm-hmm. And then he trans he transitioned his game to be a defensive player when he got to Chicago. So he did what he had to do, and uh, he was well-respected. So we just had great leadership. We had great veteran leadership. We had great leadership from our star, which was Michael Jordan, Phil Jackson. So we had all of the intangible things that was necessary for us to compete and win at the highest level. And that's my last question for you, B.J. Armstrong. Uh, How did Phil make it all work? You had a front row seat. I know you love and respect that guy. Um, I mean, you want to talk about personalities. My gosh. I mean, the alpha dog of all alpha dogs is Michael Jordan. And and then everything else that you just mentioned, Pippen wanting to get paid, all of that. How did Phil Jackson make it all work from your perspective? Well, first, 
um, Phil Jackson was very clear in that, you know, he was coaching. Every time he would give a speech, he understood that he was giving 12 different speeches <laughs> for the pregame speech. Phil Jackson understood the mindset of what it was like to be a player, and I think he learned that from, you know, being a player. I think there's something that you understand how to operate in this dysfunctional environment, right? And Phil Jackson, the more chaos for Phil Jackson, the better he is. He, he's, he's better when there's chaos. If there's nothing going on, you know, you know, he's a really good coach. But if there's chaos, if there's something going on, if there's whatever, he's that much better. So I think what made Phil Jackson connect with this group is because we were a group, the more drama and chaos was going on off the court, Michael Jordan was that much better. Our team was that much better. Phil Jackson functioned that much better. He was so much better of a coach when we were, the chips were, when our backs were against the wall. You know, Phil Jackson would, he would be so mad sometimes that he wouldn't even call a timeout if a team made a 6-8-0 run. And in a crazy way, we respected that because we're like, oh, this guy's just as crazy as we are. <laughs> <laughs> so the connection of knowing that, hey, this guy's the same as us. You know, he, he's a little off-center. I'm a little off-center. Well, you know what? We had something in common. And even though we were all different from different backgrounds, he connects with the dysfunction of what this league is. You know, coaching an NBA team, let alone an NBA superstar, that's a very difficult thing. Phil Jackson gets it. Whatever it is, he gets that, and he has a connection with the players. He has a connection with the team, and I can tell you what, if you have a team that was ready to win, you know, I couldn't think of a better coach to get you over the top than Phil Jackson, and not only did he do that in Chicago, he did that in L.A., and, um, you know, that was a gift that he had. He, was, he knew how to function in the chaos, and he was uh, – and the more chaotic it was – you know, he was better. So I think some people have a talent. That was his talent. BJ, this has been awesome. I knew it would be. To, and I knew, I knew I'm like, let's have a different guest on every Monday after the last dance. Let's get BJ Armstrong on first. And I knew after I talked to you, I'd want nobody else for the rest of the next five weeks. <laughs> well, you're, you're Hope you're free. Kind. Thank you. Please tell Susie and the family I said hello. Thanks, BJ. And uh, anytime, my friend. Right and back uh, you're at the you. best. You're the best, too. That's BJ Armstrong right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Love that guy.